Baruchot Abaot, ladies, and welcome to another weekly edition of our Torah classes. And whether you're logging on to Torah Anytime or to ohelsara.com, or if you're a YouTube subscriber and you're logging on to YouTube, thank you so very much for your devotion to the Your Neshama, to the Torah classes that you follow every single week religiously. You have no clue how happy you make me. Shem should continue to bless your spiritual endeavors and give you tremendous success and tremendous heavenly assistance. Um, we have a lot of work to do today. This um, shiur is dedicated for the Hatzlacha Meruba and the Zivug Hagun for two amazing young ladies that we hope that Be'ezat Hashem Be'karov Mamash we're going to hear good news that they're getting married um, and in the schut of this shiur and anyone who takes anything upon themselves through the shiur may it be in their merit Lea Hadasa Bat Shlomit and Saradina Bat Shlomit two tzaddikot hagunot that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves and Be'ezat Hashem Be'karov Be'karov we wish to hear Besorot, Tovot, huge Mazel Tov. And um, maybe the Shiur is going to awaken in us something that can help these two young ladies finally find their match. And maybe, maybe the story that I'm about to tell now will help, will, will be a Siman for them as well. Ladies, next week, Revi'i and Hamishi. Le Shabbat Kodesh. Next Wednesday and Thursday, we are going to be celebrating the auspicious Chag of Purim. This is the Chag of Matanot la Evyonim and Mishluchem Manot Ish le Re'ehu. This is the holiday where we provide gifts and food baskets, one man to his fellow man. And the gift I offer you in honor of Purim is a life lesson. A spiritual lesson that can elevate you and bring you to a deeper understanding of what, of what the month of Adar in this holiday truly represent. Tonight's Shi'ul is in the form of a story that was told by the great Chacham of our generation, the one and only Ravuvadia Yosef Allah Shalom. Alenu. Rav Avadi Yosef spent most of his days and nights learning Torah, as we know. So if he took time out of his Torah schedule to relay this story, there must be a very powerful lesson that he wanted us to learn, to absorb, and implement. This story was a story that he publicly said he cherished. And when he told it, he was so full of emotions, it literally made him cry. What is this story? The story goes that there was a well-known rabbi who lived a few hundred years ago. And one day he began to wonder who would sit next to him in Olam Abba, in the world to come. After all, he sacrificed his entire life for the sake of Torah learning. He didn't live a luxurious life and he relinquished the materialism of this world for spiritual endeavors. So he wanted to know who would sit next to him in Olam Haba? Who else in his generation was on his spiritual level? He wondered who, would, who his neighbor was going to be in the world to come. Who's going to be his chevruta, his study partner in the afterlife? So what did he do? That evening, he fasted the entire night and prayed fervently. And before going to sleep, he did something that's called a she'elat chalom. He asked God a question that only the heavens can reveal. He said, Ribono shel olam, master of the universe, please allow me a mere glimpse of who's going to be my neighbor and olam haba. Is there someone in my generation who's on a high level of spirituality who's going to sit next to me in Olam Abba? Can you please show me who that person is? That night he received his answer. He dreamt 
that he was being granted permission to see the person who would sit next to him in the world to come. And it was revealed to him that his neighbor in Olam Habba was none other than the local Katsav, the local butcher. When the rabbi woke up in the morning, not only couldn't he believe what he saw, but he was emotionally broken. He couldn't understand what went wrong. He thought, what happened here? All my life I dedicated myself to the study of Torah. I relinquished the materialism and luxuries of this world only to find out that after all my spiritual endeavors, the one who's going to sit next to me and Olam Abba is a mere simpleton? What does all the work that I invested in learning Torah truly mean if at the end my place will be next to a simple man, next to the local butcher, of all the people that they could pair me up with? This is the man they chose for me? Where's the upgrade that I deserve for everything that I sacrificed in honor of Torah? I don't know what to make of this. But then he thought about it again. And he said, well, maybe there's something special about this butcher that I don't know about. Maybe he's unique and I'm not aware of it. So he decided to pay him a visit. He walked into the butchery and he saw the butcher standing there wearing a smock covered in blood. The rabbi turned to the butcher and he said, Ma ma'asecha? What are you busy with? What deeds are you busy with? And the butcher looked at him and he said, What do you mean, what do, what, what do I do, what I'm, what I'm busy with? I'm a, I'm a butcher. So the rabbi answered, I, no, no, I know there's something very unique and special about you. I'd love to know what it is that you do. Please tell me. I'm begging you to tell me because I'm depressed and I'm broken because of you. So please tell me what's special or unique deed you've been involved with. So the butcher looked at the rabbi in great surprise and he said, you're, you're depressed and you're broken because of me? What did I do? And the rabbi said, please, please, just tell me what your secret is. What are the special things you engage in? The butcher thought about it and he said, Rabbi, I, I, I don't know. I really don't know what you're talking about. I mean, special deeds, special uh, chesed. Man, the only thing I could think of is that I earn 5,000 shekel a month and every month I set aside half my earnings to distribute for tzedakah for charitable purposes and the rabbi said oh that's very nice of you but nah, it's not just such a big deal I know quite a number of people who who do the same thing you do that can't be it there's got to be something else please tell me the truth what are some of the unique deeds you did in your life thus far now ladies, I'm going to veer off from the story for a second. Just to think about this butcher for a second. This is a man who gave away half of his earnings to tzedakah. He used half of his wages to help support the people in his town, to assist with the orphans in the community, the widows in the city, to help fund weddings, and he did this every single month. Yet the rabbi didn't give too much credit to that particular deed, claiming he knew many people who do what the butcher did. You know what that tells me? It tells me that the deeds of the Jews in that generation, the deeds were tremendous. Giving away half their funds to charity every month was something that was considered for them the norm. I mean, these people didn't distribute only a ma'aser of their earnings. No, they didn't just tithe. They didn't give the 10% mandated, mandated in the Torah. They didn't even set aside 20%, which is asked of us, um, of us people who earn a little more than usual. These Jews allocated 50% to charitable causes. That was their minimum, not their maximum. 
These Jews were so great that they wanted to be 50% partners with God. They said, Hashem, whatever you provide us with is going to be split 50-50. Because we're partners. These were the Jews that existed once upon a time. To the extent that when the butcher told the rabbi that he gave away 50% of his earnings to charity, the, the rabbi wasn't even fazed by it. He considered that charitable act quite a common one. Anyway, back to our story. The rabbi told the butcher, please tell me the truth. Be open with me. I promise you I'm not going to reveal this to anybody. Tell me what other great deed you were involved with and trust me. There's a good reason why I'm asking this question. And I'm even going to make you a deal. If you tell me about your unique deed, I'll reveal to you why I'm here today and what was disclosed to me by the heavens above concerning you. So the butcher, you know, started thinking again. And he said, Rabbi, I, I really don't know what to tell you. I'm, I'm a simple Jew. I'm your average Joe Schmo. And the rabbi said, think harder. Think again. So the butcher's thinking and thinking and he says, maybe it might have something to do with a story that took place 30 years ago. He says, oh, what took place 30 years ago? Tell me. So the butcher says, well, you see, one day I looked out of the window of the butchery and I noticed a group of Arabs huddled together around some people that were in chains. I noticed that all those people who were chained together, they were prisoners. And when I took a, a closer look, I realized that the Arabs, they were actually pirates. And it was very common for pirates to ambush a ship at sea and then take all the belongings of the people aboard and even take the passengers as captives they'd hold their captives for a huge ransom. So I immediately realized that these pirates probably looted a ship and took these poor captives with them. Among that group of captives was a young girl who was crying bitterly. Of course, I immediately ran out of the shop and I asked the young girl, little girl, why are you crying? And she said, I'm crying because I'm a Jewish girl. I'm crying because my father was a great rabbi and my mother was a righteous woman. And these pirates attacked our ship. They took everything we owned and then took us as captives. I don't even know where my father and mother are. So you know why I'm crying? I'm a Jewish girl and these pirates are Rishayim. Who knows what kind of plans they have for me? I'm only 12 years old and I'm scared of what they're going to do to me. So butcher tells the rabbi, Rabbi, I, I can't tell you how distraught I was concerning the plight of this little girl. So I asked her, do you want me to try and gather the funds to redeem you from captivity? And she said, Sir, if you could redeem me, I would bless you with every blessing in my heart. I beg you to save me from these awful men. It says, Rabbi, when I heard the young girl utter these words, I knew I had to take action. I found out who the head pirate was. I approached him and I asked him, How much do you want for that little girl? Of course, he took a look at the keeper on my head and he knew that I was Jewish. And he also knew that the little girl was Jewish. So he knew that he could make a killing on me. And he did. He asked for a fortune of money. Where am I going to get that kind of money? So of course I tried to negotiate with him, but to no avail. This pirate knew that he had the upper hand and he refused to budge from his asking price. But I saw this young Jewish girl in chains crying and I couldn't let her down so you know what I did I closed the shop 
And I spent the entire day and the entire night going from house to house, from town to town, trying to collect the funds needed to redeem her from captivity. And Baruch Hashem, I managed to collect a lot of money and I was able to redeem the young girl. And then I brought this little girl back to my home, back to our family. And I clothed her and I fed her. I was like a father to her. I sent her to a good Jewish school. She became another daughter in our house. And when she turned 18 and became of marriageable age, I turned to my only son, my Ben Yachid, a son who I knew was going to be a future Talmid Chacham of our people. I turned to him and I said, my dear child, you're my only son and you know that I would never steer you wrong. So try to understand what I'm going to ask of you. This young girl who grew up in our house as one of my own is a daughter of a great Talmudic scholar, of a great Talmud Chacham. Her midot, her character traits and refinement, they're incredible. She's so humble, she's so modest, she's truly a special young lady. And we were zaycha to watch her grow up in our home. Please listen closely to me, to me, my son, and listen with the knowledge that I would never misguide you. I want you to marry this girl. This is the girl I wish should be your bride. The butcher tells the rabbi, Rabbi, my son looked at me and he said, Abba, I know you'd never steer me in the wrong direction. So if this is the young girl that you wish for me to marry, I will, and I'll do so happily. Mazel tov! The happy news was announced and all the people in our city says were ecstatic. Everyone thought this was a perfect match and they were happy for my son and this young girl who grew up in our home. Anyway, Rabbi, I prepared the most elaborate wedding for the two of them in the town square, in a public square, and invited the whole town. And on the day of the wedding, guess what? I was the father of the Chatan and the father of the Kala. Nobody ever heard of such a thing. And of course, the wedding was a magnificent wedding. I didn't spare a thing for this bride and groom. Everybody was there in attendance. Even all the rabbis of the city joined us. And you have no clue how much joy there was on that night. As people were sitting there at the tables waiting for the chuppah ceremony to begin. So I decided to walk around from one table to the next to drink a l'chaim with our guests, you know, and to thank them for coming. Every table, everyone at every table was so happy. That is, all but the people at one of the tables. The table where the rabbis were seated was filled with sorrow. None of the rabbis were eating or drinking. They all looked so sad and so forlorn. I didn't know what to do. So I asked them, Kvod Rabbanim, is there, is there something wrong? Please tell me, is, is the food not good enough? Because if it's not, I can have something prepared especially for you. What? Is it the wine? Is there something that's, that's bothering you? Because if yes, I'll do anything to correct the matter so that you could celebrate with us with a happy disposition. After all, this is my only son's wedding and I want you to be mesameachim. I want you to rejoice together with him. And they all said to me, not at all, not at all. This is the most beautiful and emotional wedding we've ever attended. But how could we be happy to share in your simcha when there's a poor young man sitting over there at the next table crying his heart out. And no matter what we say to him, we can't seem to lift his spirits. So you tell us how could we sit here smiling when there's a young man crying 
at the next table? How could you want us to get up and dance and celebrate with you and your son when there's a Jew and so much pain? As long as that poor Jew is crying, we cannot be misameach you or your son. Says, Rabbi, when I heard what those rabbis said, I immediately approached the poor young man and I said, Sir, why do you sit here and cry? Please tell me what I could do to lift your spirits. Please tell me what I could do to relieve your worry. I'll do anything for you to be happy. And then this poor young man pointed to the kala, to my adopted daughter, the bride, and he said, do you see that girl, the bride? I was engaged to be married to her before she was kidnapped by the pirates. Our parents wanted us to marry one another and arranged our marriage when we were young. She and I made a promise to one another that we would never marry anyone else. And now I see that she's about to walk down to the chuppah with your son. And I don't have any complaints against you. On the contrary, I heard about the great deeds that you did with my betrothed. How you redeemed her from captivity. How you saved her life. How you took her into your home as, and raised her as one of your own. But you must understand that when I heard that her ship was attacked, I thought I'd never see her again, only to find out much later on that some butcher in a faraway country saved her life. So I traveled all this way so I could finally be married to her. And I arrived only today to realize that it was too late. I heard about the wedding and all the kindnesses you did for my bride and I just didn't have the heart to say anything to you after all the good that you did for her. So I came to the wedding hoping to be happy for her and for your son. But then I saw her and I burst into tears. I couldn't help it. Think about it. As happy as I could be for your son Think about what I'm going through. This young lady was engaged to me. We promised each other that we would never take another partner. And here she is with someone else. Is that really fair? Rabbi, the butcher tells the rabbi, shock wouldn't be the proper term for what happened to me in those moments that this poor boy spoke. I was beside myself. But at the same time, I was all suspicious. So I asked him, how do I know that what you're saying is true? And the poor young man said, please go and ask her if what I'm saying is true. So the poor young boy told me his name, where he lived, told me the name of his parents, and with that information, I approached my adopted daughter, the bride, and I asked her, my dear daughter, tell me the truth. Were you ever engaged before you were taken captive? Suddenly, her eyes fell, and she gulped. Yes. I was engaged before. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So I asked her, did you promise your previous Hatan that you wouldn't marry anyone else? And she said, yes. I gave him my word that I wouldn't marry anyone else. But then our ship was attacked and I ended up in your city thinking I'd never see him again because he lived on the other side of the world. And after everything that you did for me all these years, how could I have said no to you when you asked me to marry your only son? I really did think that my extenuating circumstances voided me 
from the promise that I made to him. So I asked my adopted daughter, could you point him out in the crowd? So she looked around the room, noticing a familiar face, and she said, that's him sitting over there right next to the rabbi's table. And indeed, that was the young man who she was previously engaged to. Rabbi, at that moment I had a huge dilemma. What am I going to do? But somehow I knew what had to be done even without asking the rabbis there what to do. I immediately walked over to my son, took him aside, and said to him, Beyom Hatonato Ubeyom Simchat Libo. My dear son and only son, you know how much I love you and how I would never do anything to hurt you. You know whatever I tell you is only for your good. So I ask you this. Would you feel comfortable marrying a girl who is engaged to someone else and promised never to marry anyone else? And my son looked at me in utter confusion and he said, no, of course I wouldn't feel comfortable with that, but why do you ask that question? So I said to him, my dear son, that's exactly what happened with your bride and we were not aware of it. I only found out about it this minute and it's not even her fault because she assumed that since she was taken prisoner and, trans and transported to the other side of the world, she didn't know if she'd ever see her former Hatan. She genuinely assumed that due to her extenuating circumstances, she was exonerated from any promises she ever made to him. But now, my dear son, this poor young man that she was engaged to is sitting here at this wedding, crying and in a great deal of pain, bemoaning his loss. If this poor young man managed to arrive to our city from the other side of the globe in search of his bride and he arrived on the day of the wedding that's a sign from Shamaim that the young woman who grew up in our home belongs to him and not to you so I'm asking you to do something that's going to require a great sacrifice on your part Please take off your celebratory clothing and give it to this poor young man and let him be the one to marry your bride. My son looked at me with the most trusting eyes, but eyes filled with tears, and he began to remove his suit. I took my only son's wedding suit walked over to the poor young man and dressed him in that suit and then I sent my son home and that night the wedding proceeded as scheduled but instead of my son walking down the aisle I walked this poor young man down the aisle as if he were my own son and then I walked the bride down to the chuppah as if she was my own daughter. Not only that, but when it came time for the dancing, I danced with such joy in my heart on behalf of them and even in front of them. I was dancing with the same happiness in my heart that I would have felt if I was marrying my own child. And after the week of Sheva Barchot, I bought them a small home. And I bought them all the necessary items needed to begin a new life as a couple. And I made certain that the young man secured a job so that he can earn a decent living. And they became part of my home as if they were my own children. 
And now, years later, they have children of their own and they live so happily. And would you believe that shortly after that wedding, my son became engaged to somebody else and he too is living happily with children. And what I realized from this whole story, Rabbi, is that Hashem does indeed run this world. The rabbi looked at the butcher and he began to cry. And he said to him, I'm now going to reveal to you why I'm here. You see, I also realized something now. I realized that it's not you who's the lucky one. It's me. I'm the guy with the mazel. I'm the lucky guy. Because the heavens revealed to me that I'm going to be sitting next to you and Olam Habba. And at first I didn't understand how that's possible. I spent my entire life sacrificing, sacrificing for the sake of Torah. And I thought I'm going to end up being neighbors with somebody like me. I took for granted the fact that there could be a Jew that appears quite simple so average on the surface when on the inside he may be as great or even greater than some of the big rabbis that sit and learn Torah all day long now that I know who you are I want you to know that it's an honor to meet you down here on earth and it will be my honor to sit next to you in Olam Abba it's a big schut for me to be your neighbor in the world to come and I'm actually wondering if I'm really ra'oi if I'm even worthy to be the one to sit next to you in the world to come because you taught me a huge life lesson something the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot says but now I was granted a true life glimpse Rabbi Meir Omer Rabbi Meir says Al tistakel bakankan. Look not at the vessel, ela b'masheyesh bo, but rather at what the vessel contains, because yesh kankan chadash maleyashan. There might be a new vessel filled with old wine, veyashan sheafilu chadash en and an old vessel that doesn't even contain no wine. Today I learned that we cannot make any judgment or conclusion regarding any person based on how things appear to us. There are so many times in life that we think we know everything there is to know about a person based on his exterior, based on his life, the way his life appears on the surface and the things that our eyes see and the things that our ears hear. Many times we assume that the person is not on such a high spiritual level, that he's deficient in certain areas of life, that he's lacking in Wuhaniyut based on what we think we know, based on our personal experience from him, with him. There are times we draw conclusions based even on how others perceive that person. And rabbis such as myself can sadly assume that they're on a higher spiritual plane because of their status, you know, our status, their learning in Avodat Hashem. And as rabbis we can make a grave mistake concerning a person the same way I did concerning you. Truth be told, when I first heard you'd be my per partner in Shamaim, I was upset and I was confused and I was broken because I regarded you as a simple butcher who couldn't possibly be on my level. But now I learned a valuable lesson. Al tistakel bakan kan. I had no clue who you really were and how great you really are. And now I know you are far greater than me.
That's the end of that story. And that's the lesson I want to impart to you. We never know who we're going to be sitting next to in Olam Haba. We have our visions of who we want it to be, but we never know who it's going to be. You know, instead of looking down from Shabbat, <laughs> instead of looking down to see who's going to be beneath us up there, and we might be just be looking up in amazement to see who it is that's above us. Because does anybody here know the true Gadlut? The real greatness of his fellow Jew? Do we understand the magnitude of the neshama of our fellow Jew or the enormity of what they've done with their life or how they live it or what sacrifices they make or how Hashem really views them? There could be someone we think is not worthy, someone we think is problematic, someone we think has issues, for whatever reasons we concluded, but in Hashem's eyes, He's most beloved. Hashem favors Him because He knows how much He's sacrificing for Him in ways we don't, and in ways we probably never could. The point is that we don't know what Hashem sees and knows about that person or how Hashem regards that individual. Perhaps his deeds are far greater than ours. We have no clue how Hashem views a person or how much he saves him and his mashgiach over him, is watching over him. We don't know the scorecard in Shamaim of who's leading and who's lagging behind. But I think that we've experienced enough throughout history to have learned this valuable lesson. Didn't we go through enough to know that what you see is not always what you get? Don't we realize that this is a world of smoke and mirrors? This is a world where we think the neighbor to our right is the biggest tzaddikah, while the neighbor to the left, she's the one with the issues, she's the one who's unhealthy, she's the one who's really got to get her act together, she's the one who's displaying all kinds of signs and is devalued in our eyes. But it could be just the opposite. We don't know what goes on in the home of the tzaddikah. We don't know how she's really behaving, maybe towards her husband. Uh, the words she utters about her friends that are embarrassing and degrading. The things she says and does that nobody is aware of. While the one we think to the left, who's defective, may very well be more worthy in Hashem's eyes. Perhaps even the more sincere and virtuous of the two. This month of Adal and the Chag of Purim teaches us about the world of masquerading. Purim is the holiday where we put on a mask and we dress up in costumes. Do you understand the significance of that? That's the calling of Purim. That's the Venaha Fuchu. Purim says, why do you only look at the outside and assume that the outside and the inside are identical. Why do you think a person is who he is based on his costume, based on the mask that he wears for you to see? Don't you realize that what's on the outside may have nothing to do with what's truly taking place on the inside? It's important to disclose the person behind the mask to uncover the truth beneath the surface. Don't you want to know who's really hiding behind the mask? A person can present himself on the outside, for the outside, as the most benevolent and altruistic person, but on the inside, he's flawed because he's doing things that a Jew should never do and nobody knows about it. Nobody knows about it. The outside is only a facade. Who the person is on the outside and how his life appears may have very little to do with who he really is on the inside and what's really going on in his house on the inside. And the opposite is also true. Venahafahu. On the outside, a person appears to be less righteous, 
He seems flawed. He seems like he's got a lot of issues. When in truth, he's very pure. He's honorable. And in Hashem's eyes, he's meromam. He's elevated. The same is true with this person, who he appears to be on the outside, has very little to do with who he truly is on the inside. The outside is only a facade. That's the message of Adar. It's the message of all messages, and perhaps that's why the scroll that recounts the story of Purim is called Megillat Esther. Megillah doesn't just mean a scroll. It comes from the word legalot, which means to reveal. What is the Megillah coming to reveal? It's coming to reveal Esther. Esther means hidden. You know what that means? Behind the mask of Megillat Esther, beneath the mask of Esther lies the Giloi the revelation of the story. How Hashem was indeed the one behind the mask, orchestrating every occurrence in that story from start to finish. And maybe that's why we dress up on Purim. If you think about it, throughout the Purim story, a lot is hidden that slowly becomes revealed. For example, Esther hides her Jewish identity while she's living in the palace. Mordechai, saving the king from an assassination attempt, is written down in the king's journal, but then hidden away. That journal is hidden away. Haman hides his true hatred for the Jews from Ahasuerus, and he provides a political reason for why the Jews need to be destroyed. When Esther first invites Ahasuerus and Haman to her wine banquet, she does not reveal her true intentions. It's hidden. But notice how each of the examples that I gave does indeed become revealed later on, later on in the story. At some point, when Achashverosh cannot sleep in the middle of the night, he asks for his journals to be read, only to remember that Mordechai saved his life. What was hidden becomes revealed. Eventually, Estelle reveals not only her identity, but the true identity of the perpetrator, the one who's a threat to her and her people, that being Haman. His hiddenness becomes revealed. Not only that, but Chachamim point out the fact that Hashem is notice noticeably absent from the story, and his name is not openly mentioned in the Megillah. And what we discover is that like many parts of the Purim story, Hashem is hidden, but then revealed through the actions that take place in the story. That's what we would call, we would call that a hidden miracle, a nes nistar, versus an open miracle, a nes galui, like the exodus from Egypt. During Yitziat Mitzrayim, Hashem's presence was very obvious, and he played a major role in the story. Whereas in the Purim story, Hashem is kind of working behind the scenes, masterminding and orchestrating without anybody kind of taking notice. But what we learn, and we already know, is that just because something is hidden doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'll say that again. Just because something is hidden doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just because Esther keeps her Jewish identity hidden doesn't mean she's not Jewish. Just because Ahasuerus convenient, conveniently forgot that Mordechai saved his life and he hid that incident away in the back of his mind doesn't mean it never happened. Just because Hashem is not visible in the story doesn't mean He wasn't present. Just because you hide something doesn't mean it isn't there. And Hashem was indeed the mastermind behind Haman's evil decree. And He was the mastermind behind the salvation of the story as well. Hashem was the one behind the mask of redemption all along. If we want to see God, all we need to do 
is look beyond the exterior, beyond the hester, and will be zeicha to a gilui, to see what's revealed on the inside. Al tistakil ba kankan, ella b'ma sheyesh bo. On the outside, the story of Purim is like the kankan, like the vessel. But behind the mask of Purim lies the past, present, and future world. That which lies beyond the exterior, revealing the truth. And when Hashem is in a state of hester, a state of hiddenness, when He resides temporarily behind the mask, we have to take the time to look behind the hester and trust that it is and always will be HaKadosh Baruch behind everything that appears obscure and uncertain. And if we could somehow unveil that which is hidden, if we could take the time to remove the mask to discover who stands behind the mask, we would be zeichet to true nisim. The ness of the month of Nisan and the redemption that actually took place in that month that's what happened to the Jews in Shushan Abira. The moment they realized who it was that stood behind the mask of Haman's decree. The moment they unveiled the Creator. The moment the Jews removed the mask. They realized that the outside, the kankan, the mask, that was a Hajverosh and Haman. But behind the mask, the one who unleashed the enemies, that was a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And if Hashem was behind the mask of strict justice, that meant that everything in the story was the will of the Ribbono Shel Olam, and their tikkun now was to discover what's li what lies behind the mask of Din, and what they could do to repent and correct so that they can be ultimately saved. When the Jews removed the mask and discovered that it was God begging them to repent. When they began to fast, pray, and they turned to Hashem, and only Hashem, that's when the salvation manifested. And it was manifested in the month of redemption, the month of Nisan. So the story of Purim, of masks, and who stands behind them, tells of one of our greatest struggles as a nation and what we could do to correct. One of the lessons we learn from the story of Purim is that what we see on the surface of our world is only part of what truly exists. There is always more that's hidden. So in this sense, uh, dressing up in a costume and wearing a mask is a perfect way to celebrate Purim because it's meant to teach us something. Think of it this way. For many people, the concept of dressing up in a costume and putting on a mask is something they do every day, not just on Purim. There are people who hide certain parts of who they are what they're really thinking. They hide what they're really feeling. And they do that because they don't want others to see them in a negative light. They don't want to be judged unfavorably. Unfavor they're actually petrified of being judged. And they have a need to present to the outside world a perfect picture. And if they do anything less than perfect, it affects their ego, it affects them. So they'll fight to appear as perfect as they can possibly appear on the outside when they know how flawed they are on the inside. Usually, and especially with people who suffer from emotional imbalances, you'll notice how they sadly, very sadly, put on all sorts of masks in order to actually blend in with everybody else in the community, in the family, and they, with their friends. They want to try to feel and seem normal uh, while they're at work, while they're with their friends, whether they're in a public setting. And what they'll do is they'll wear the I'm okay mask. They will, they're they're going to wear the oh I'm very happy now mask or the oh I feel great mask. And they wear those masks 
because they don't want to admit to themselves or to anybody else that actually they're not okay and they're not really that happy and they're not really feeling that good so what do they do they put on a mask with a smile on it the mask that they think they put on where they choose they think they choose to be happy the mask that shows them laughing and supposedly having a blast with everybody around them and they do that in order to hide the sadness and the pain that they're really feeling and experiencing a pain and sadness that they're not going to admit some people wear their masks so well that they live in denial concerning how they truly feel because they convince themselves that the mask of happiness that they're wearing is truly how they feel when the opposite is true you see this mask I'm happy so it must be that I'm happy I'm really really happy no you're not happy if you'd remove the mask people would see that you're really not happy you're just afraid to admit it but like in the story of Purim we know that just because something is hidden doesn't mean it's not there just because you hide behind the mask of happiness doesn't mean you are happy the lesson of life that Megillat Esther teaches us is to see behind the masks so you know what one of the reasons is that we dress up on Purim dressing up in a costume should prompt us to ask ourselves the following questions what image do I want the outside world to see and is that image really me the costume is meant to make us more of aware of what we're really hiding underneath it's the concept of sinat chinam and making judgments based on what we see based on what we think based on what we experienced about a person based on the outside rather than what the reality truly is it's the concept of displaying a mask to the outside world that which a person wants others to think concerning him the facade that he creates when in truth the person who stands behind that mask is someone who's very far removed from that facade it's the idea of wearing a mask that others want you to wear because that's what they decide will be good for you that's how they'd like you to be that's what they want to see that's what they want you to become when inside that's not really what you want that's not what you desire that's not who you are that's not how you feel we all live a life of facades making false judgments based on the facades and such a life leads nowhere but to the enslavement of our own true selves while relinquishing the freedom to be and to live our most authentic self not only that but just like in the story that I began the shiur with the month of Adar and the holiday of Purim should prompt us to uncover the treasure that exists inside every single Jew that we judge and draw conclusions about Dafka because we tend to see their mask and not, not what lies behind it having that kind of knowledge turns us into more supportive and empathetic people and turns us into more appreciative human beings because we begin to discover that the person who stands behind the mask might just be far greater than we thought the story that I told you at the beginning of the shiur teaches us about the greatness of tzedakah of charitable acts as you know we have a Purim campaign I urge every single one of you Oh Hell Sir is such an amazing organization the things that we do the things that are accomplished the people that are growing the young girls that are thriving help us to continue our good work throughout this whole entire week and a half and through Purim we urge you to please log on to www.ohelsara.com 
and click on the donate button and donate to us. You can donate on a monthly basis, you can donate just a one-time uh, donation, but please help us to continue to support those that need spiritual enlightenment, spiritual elevation. That the month of Adar should awaken in us the desire to do tshuva for wearing masks where we pretend to be what we're not. We should be zeicher to see the genuineness and the greatness behind the mask of our fellow Jews, the ones that we judge solely based on the outside and what we perceive. Let's beg Hashem to unveil His countenance, to remove upon Himself the state of Esther Panim, so that His full glory be revealed to the entire world, so that we could enter into a month of Yeshua, of salvation and redemption. Amen Ken.